الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا بني آدم قد أنزلنا ولباس التقوى ذلك خير ذلك من آيات الله لعلهم يتذكرون صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد One of the most misunderstood concepts in Islam is the concept of hijab. We see that it is misunderstood with Muslims just like it is misunderstood with non-Muslims. With non-Muslims, we see the accusations the attacks against the religion of Islam and one of the attacks is that the religion of Islam oppresses women the religion of Islam is a misogynistic religion where it favors the men over the women and the images of hijab the images of the burqa the images of the face cover are shown to show that the religion of Islam is a religion that restricts and contains and confines the female and does not allow her to reach her highest potential. This is one common attack against the religion of Islam that we see, and especially during the era that we live, the era of Islamophobia. It is very common to see such attacks against the religion of Islam. But on the other hand, you find that hijab, it is also misunderstood with Muslims. Just like non-Muslims attack the religion of Islam because they do not understand the concept of hijab, you see that Muslims are very divided when it comes to the hijab. You look at every nation, every community, every group of people, you see that they have a specific type of hijab. Some hijabs, they are in one way. Another hijab is a different way. If you look at the pictures of the Muslim countries, you will see that each country, they have their own type of hijab. Although it doesn't vary very much, but there is there are some differences when it comes to the hijab. And this is, if it proves anything, it proves that the Muslims, they are not monolith. The Muslims, they are not all the same. And this is something that the media here with Islamophobia, they try to give the impression that all of the Muslims are exactly the same. But this is just like anything else. Just like with everything else, Muslims are not the same. All of the Muslims are not the same. There are over 1.6 billion Muslims out there. How can we expect all to be the same? And when it comes to hijab, you see that Muslims are also divided. It is one of the issues that you see Muslims, although there is an agreement, there is no Muslim scholar, there is no Muslim sect that says hijab is not wajib, hijab is not obligatory. All of them, despite all of the differences, they all <coughs> agree that hijab is obligatory, but you still see that there are certain ways of looking at hijab, certain ways of practicing hijab that vary. And sometimes it is easier for a person to prove to a non-Muslim 
the principle of hijab than to prove it to a Muslim. You find some non-Muslims, some Muslims, they say we go to non-Muslims, a Muslim sister, she goes to a non-Muslim, to a school or to work, and she's wearing hijab. So they tell her, what are you doing? She tells them, this is the Islamic attire, this is my garment that the religion of Islam instructs me to wear. So they say, that's fine. But then they tell her, but then there's another Muslim who doesn't wear hijab. There's this other lady who doesn't practice hijab. Or there's this other guy who likes to hand out hugs to women. And now you're telling me you can't shake hands? This guy, he's a Muslim, but he hands out hugs. And you say you can't shake hands? So you see that even with Muslims, there is misunderstanding and that leads to some confusion. And there are some Muslims right now, they say, I don't know what hijab is. I see my mom, she wears hijab in one way. I see my father, he says one thing. I see the Shaykh at the Masjid, the Sayyid, he says something. I see different communities, each one is wearing it in one way or another. What is the real hijab? What is the true definition of hijab? Whenever we want to seek the true representation of the religion of Islam, we have to resort to the true representatives of the religion of Islam. And that is the Qur'an and Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt salam. They are the only ones that can represent the religion of Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he tells the Muslims, إِنِّي تَارِكٌ فِيكُمُ الثَّقَلَيْنِ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَعِتْرَةِ أَهْلَ بَيْتِي I am leaving behind the two weighty things, the book of Allah and my Ahlul Bayt, my Itra, my family. They are parallel to one another. You cannot accept one and reject the other. Some people, they come and they say, hijab is not mentioned in the Qur'an, in the hijab that we know today. It's not mentioned in the Qur'an. First of all, it is mentioned in the Qur'an. Second, we do not take all of our rules from the Qur'an. We take our rules from Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt as well. Otherwise, if I were just to take all of my rules from the Qur'an, then I wouldn't know how many rak'ahs to pray Maghrib, Maghrib, Isha, Dhuhr, Asr, Fajr. I wouldn't know many of the details of my worship. Isn't the most important act of worship prayer? Allah does not say how many rak'ahs you pray for the Maghrib, Isha, and the prayers. That, you have to take it from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And there's a reason that sometimes the Qur'an is vague. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ مِنْهُ آيَاتٌ مُحْكَمَاتٌ هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ وَأُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهِ ابْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ وَابْتِغَاءَ تَأْوِيلَةِ Allah says, He is the one who brought down the book, أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ فِيهِ آيَاتٌ There are verses that are bayinat, there are verses that are very clear. It doesn't need explanation. وَلُهُ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ Very clear. But then there are other verses that are not very clear. وَأُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ The mutashabih, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place verses in the Qur'an that are not very clear? Muslim scholars, they've answered this. They say, first of all, so that the Qur'an will not be treated like any book. If it's a book that you understand, you read it once and then you go and you put it on the shelf, you're not going to read it anymore. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Qur'an in a way where that every time you read it, you have a new thought in your mind. You learn something new. And this is one of the miracles of the Qur'an. Even if you've been reading the Qur'an your whole life, but you read it again, you will see that you discovered something new. And especially during the month of Ramadan, which is the season of the recitation of the Qur'an where we recite more of the Qur'an than we usually do. And the second reason, the second reason the Qur'an is not very clear and it's vague at times, is so that we resort to the representatives, to the ones who the Qur'an came down in their homes, to the ones who can explain the Qur'an. If the Qur'an was clear, then I wouldn't need to go to Rasulullah, I wouldn't need to go to the Ahlul Bayt. The Qur'an, we go to the Ahlul Bayt, we go to Rasulullah <coughs> to explain. Now, when it comes to hijab, we take it from the Qur'an, the concept of hijab, but we also take it 
from Rasulullah and from the Ahlul Bayt. Many times people, they've come and they try to argue, they try to debate. No, 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 it's not mentioned that, that way in the Quran, in the de exact detail that the Muslim scholars, they say it's supposed to be practiced. Yes, the, it's completely normal if it's not mentioned in the way that you understand it. Although it is mentioned, and I will explain. When we look at the verse, when we look at the Quran, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about hijab in two dimensions. Allah points out two dimensions in regards to the hijab. The first dimension is the physical dimension, the materialistic dimension. Allah says in the Quran, Allah says in the Quran, Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, قَدْ أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ لِبَاسًا يُوَارِي سَوْآتِكُمْ وَرِيشًا We have brought down upon you libas, clothes that protect your private parts, that protect your body, warisha, rishas feather. We have brought this down upon you, and then Allah says, وَلِبَاسُ taqwa." And then there's another type of libas, there's another type of garment, and that is the garment of piety. وَلِبَاسُ taqwa ذَلِكَ خَيْرٍ what is the first libas? What is the first garment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses in the Quran? This is the first hijab. This is the materialistic hijab. And hijab, by definition, it is not just the scarf that the Muslim woman wear. That's not the only definition of hijab. Hijab is a very, it has a broad definition and it has a more specific definition. The broad definition is anything that can be created, that can create a barrier. For example, this wall, it's a hijab, because it's a barrier from who's in this room and who's in the other room. The clothes, they're a type of hijab, because they're a barrier from the skin, the body, to the outside. That is hijab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses, points out, one of the etiquettes of coming and visiting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa There were Muslims that used to come sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some Muslims they used to come in the house of Rasulullah and they used to spend hours there. They used to sit there wasting his time and then they would go, they would peek in the house and then they would go and talk to the wives of the prophets without any etiquette. The prophet was embarrassed to say something to them. Because he was, he was shy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points it out in the Quran. Oh people, do not, do not enter on the prophets except when you seek permission. And then Allah says, وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُنَّ مَتَاعًا فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ When you ask, when you come and you need something from the Prophet, from the wives of the Prophet, you want to ask something? Ask from behind the hijab, behind the veil, behind the wall. So we see that in this verse, the hijab is used as a wall. That is one of the definitions of hijab because it creates a barrier. But then there is also another meaning of hijab and that is the hijab that the Muslim women are instructed to wear. And of course, Muslim men have to also practice. And we see that that hijab, it is pointed out in the Quran in numerous ways. Two words that are used to point out that hijab one is khimar and the other is jilbab. Khimar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَىٰ جِيُوبِهِنَّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the hijab. Allah instructs the Prophet to tell the Muslims to take their khimar, the khimar that they already have on them, وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَىٰ جِيُوبِهِنَّ Let them take the khimar that they're already wearing, the head scarf, but let them cover their cleavage, let them cover their chest. What does this prove? This proves that the, Mus the Muslims and before Islam, women were already wearing a head cover. They were already wearing a head cover, but the only problem was that it was revealing the chest. Their head was covered, but the chest was revealed. So Allah says, وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرَهِنْ He doesn't instruct them to wear khimar. He says, let them take the khimar that they're already wearing, the hijab that they're already wearing, and let them wrap it around their neck. Let them bring it and cover their chest area. This is one verse. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the jilbab. 
Khimar is the scarf. Jilbab, it is the outer garment. It is the loose garment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Muslim woman to wear so that their body, so that the physical body is not revealed. So that the physical body is not very clear. No one could be able to distinguish the body of the female. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nabi, qul li azwajik. O Prophet, tell your wives, wa banatik, and your daughters, wa nisa'il mu'mineen, and the wives, and the women of the mu'mineen, of the believers, yudnina alayhinna jalabi bihin. Let them take a jilbab. Jilbab is the loose garment. Dalika adna, an yu'arafna fala yu'lain. That is better for them. That way they will be respected and they will not be harassed. وَكَانَ اللَّهِ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the woman to take a loose garment and cover themselves so that the figure of the body is not very clear. The figure of the body is not shown. These are several verses in the Qur'an. And then you come and you look at the ahadith, you look at the narrations, our scholars, they say that for deriving from the Qur'an, deriving from the ahadith, deriving from the hadith of Rasulullah, the hijab for the female, she is allowed to reveal her face. The face is allowed to be revealed and the hands, and the hands from the wrist and down. Other than that, the wrist and up, and the body, the ears, the neck, that has to be covered. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs. And this is the hijab of the female. This is for someone who does not know exactly what is the definition of the hijab according to the religion of Islam. Now, this is the physical garment. This is the materialistic hijab. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points out a, an equally important, if not more important hijab, and that is the hijab of taqwa. That is the libas of taqwa. Allah says in the Quran, Ya Bani Adam, Qad anzalna alaykum libasan yuari sawatukum wa risha wa libasun taqwa. And then there's another type of garment, and that is the garment of piety. Now, attaining piety is much more difficult than just putting on a hijab. Attaining piety is much more difficult than just practicing the rules of hijab. You might see there are some that practice hijab because wearing the physical hijab it will lead to piety. Just like fasting, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Praying, it leads to piety. These are following the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But sometimes you might see someone, they do wear the hijab. But does that mean that they necessarily are pious? Does that, mean, does that mean that they are necessarily pious? No. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points out the physical hijab, and He points out the second dimension, and that is the hijab of piety. What is that hijab? What is the hijab of piety? The hijab of piety is to control yourself from looking at what's haram. It's to not look at what's haram. It's to control your, your thoughts, control your mind, Control your etiquette. Otherwise, you see many people, they wear hijab, but then they are the first ones who break the rules of hijab. Maybe someone is wearing hijab. A man, he's practicing hijab apparently in front of people, but in private, he is the one who's breaking the rules of hijab. A lady, she might be wearing hijab, but she might not have piety because of other things. So here, we see that hijab, it is not just the clothes, because many times some of the sisters, some women who do not wear hijab, they say, yes, I pray that lady, she wears hijab and she doesn't pray. You may be very right. You may be right, because there are some who wear hijab because of culture. Unfortunately, hijab has become a cultural thing today. And especially in our, and sometimes in our mosques. In our mosques, we are very worried about creating partition and doing this and making, setting up laws and here and there. But then as soon as you go outside the masjid, you see all of the rules of hijab are broken. What is this? Are we fooling ourselves? In the masjid, we create so much laws and we make it difficult. And sometimes non-Muslims, they come and they say, we can't, we don't feel welcome here. Now, that is its own issue. 
There are some communities that choose to have a partition. There are some that choose to not. It's up to the community and what the women feel comfortable in that community. However, the more important hijab is the hijab of the piety, the hijab of the hearts. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points that hijab. Before speaking to the women, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the men regarding the hijab. Because a lady, she could control, she could wear, she could cover herself. But can she force a man to control himself? No. The only thing that will control a man and a woman, control their desires, is taqwa. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs Rasulullah to tell the men first. Surah An-Nur, chapter Nur, verse 30. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, min absarihim. وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَسْكَالَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَسْمَعُونَ Tell the believing man, يَغُضُّوا أَبْصَارًا يَغُضُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارًا Let them lower their gaze. When you see haram, lower your gaze. This is the safat, this is the qualities of a mu'min. And the hadith says that if you want to test your iman, if you want to see how strong your iman is, and if you want to feel the Iman, many times people they say, I pray, I fast, I go to Hajj, but I haven't felt the Iman in my heart. The Hadith says that if you want to feel the Iman, then lower your gaze when you can see Haram. When you have the opportunity to see Haram, bring your eyes down. That is when you will feel the Iman. In another Hadith, Amir al Mu'mineen, he says, Man darfa araha qalba. The one who lowers his gaze, he brought comfort to his heart. Because the problem is, the, we have desires. We have natural instincts, desires. If you have fuel, if you have fire, do you come and pour fuel on it? No. In order to turn it off, you're not going to pour fuel on it. If someone who's not married and they have desires, they need to satisfy their desires. Does it make sense to go and look at haram? That is just fueling that desire. And it's taken away the comfort from the heart. This is why Amir al-Mu'min says, Man ghazza tarfa araha qalba. He who lowers his gaze, he's brought comfort to his heart. Because you're not creating a challenge for yourself. So Allah says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَخُطُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَعْفَضُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ They also have to cover their body. However, there are certain rules for men and certain rules for women. Because although men and women are equal in the religion of Islam, they're not the same. If Allah is going to treat them the same, then there will be injustice. And we pointed to this yesterday. So, and then Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ Allah knows exactly where you're looking. Allah knows whether you moved your eyes one inch to the right or one inch to the left. يَا لَا تَخْفَى عَلَيْهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing is hidden away from him. Every single movement of the eye, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala records that for us. He could see us. This is the first, and then the verse carries on and it goes to the woman. وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Tell the believing woman, يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ The women, they have to also lower their gaze. There are some women, they just say, Men, you close your eyes, do not look, but they want to look at whoever they want. This is also haram. وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Let them also lower their gaze. وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُجَهُمْ And let them protect their body, protect their private parts. And then Allah carries on. وَنَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُمْ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا And do not show the zina, the adornment, except that which is made apparent. إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا From this, this is where scholars and the imams, they conclude that the hands and the face can be shown. Because this is what's apparent. Other than that, it is not apparent. This is not ma zahara minha. This is one of the verses that they use to come up with this ishtihad, to come up with this ruling. And then the same verse, it carries on. وَلَا يَضْرَبْنَ بِأَرْجُلِهِنْ لِيُعْلَمْ مَا يُخْفِينَ مِنْ زِينَتِهِنْ at that time, during the time of Arabia, and even in some cultures today, you find that some women, they wear bracelets on their, on their uh, ankles. Anklets, I don't know what they're called. They're, they make noise. 
when a, when a lady is walking, you could hear her from a mile away. She's, she, she's making the, it makes the noise, and this it attracts attention. It attracts attention. And until today, you see, it still happens. Sometimes you're sitting in a class, or you're sitting in an office, you hear a, ta, 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 ta. a lady walking with high heels. From a mile away, you could hear her, and everyone is, everyone is distracted, no one can pay attention, everyone loses track of what they're doing. Because of this one sound. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَضْرِبْنَ بِأَرْجُلِهِنْ لِيُعْلَمْ مَا يُخْفِينَ مِنْ زِينَتِهِنْ And that they should not strike their feet on the ground so that what is hidden becomes apparent. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells a woman, you have a beauty. You are not created the same as a man. A lady, she has beauty. And that beauty should be Revealed only to the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed. Only to the one who will respect you. Not the ones who just want to look at your body. The ones who just want to exploit your body. Keep that beauty for the special people in your life. Don't show that beauty to everyone in your life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, women can have attention. Some people they say, no, women are not allowed to have attention and stuff. There's nothing wrong with seeking attention. As long as it's positive attention, not negative attention. Do women like to be catcalled? Do they like to be called out when they're walking in the streets? Most women, they say no. Most women find that offensive. They find that a type of sexual abuse where someone is just talking to them and throwing remarks just based on their looks. There's a clip on YouTube. I'm sure many of you have seen it. There's a lady. She walks in New York City, I believe. She walks, she walks in New York City for, I don't know, half a day, 10 hours or so. She's walking one time without hijab, just normal clothes, somewhat revealing. And then the same lady, she walks with hijab, with the Islamic attire. And there's someone who's walking in front of her. Of course, it's a hidden camera. They do not know. 10 hours, the first time she's walking without hijab, Constantly men are throwing words, constantly whistling, throwing remarks, catcalling, and she keeps walking. The whole time they're constantly looking at her and throwing remarks. Then the next time when she is wearing the Islamic attire, she's wearing the hijab, she walks. The same amount of time, no one even gives her that negative attention. No one looks at her in a negative way. Now, as a sister, as my dear sister, as my aunt, woman here who I respect, or a woman who's like my daughter, who's like my sister, or if you want your daughter, your sister, your family member, how do you want her to be walking in the street? How do you want people to look at her? Do you want people to look at her for her looks? Do you want that type of attention? Or do you want her to seek attention for her intellect, for what she has to offer? You look at the woman in Islam, look at Khadija. Look at Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Look at Sayyidah Zainab. The woman in Islam, spe specifically the women of the Ahlul Bayt, they were outspoken. They came out and they spoke. Khadija, she sacrificed for the religion of Islam in a way that none of the other women during her time sacrificed. Fatima al-Zahra, she sacrificed for the religion of Islam in a way that none of the other women sacrificed. Sayyidah Zainab, she kept the message of Imam Hussein alive. She spoke out when she needed to. But did she compromise her hijab? Did she seek negative attention? Unfortunately today, some they say that the only way I could be accepted in society and the only way I could have any attention is if I come out and I show my body, show my hair. But think about it. Is it worth it to show your body in a way where people are going to look at you and accept you just for your body? Today you look at some of the uh, movies and you look at some of the news anchors, you see that they only bring someone who is, according to their own image, society's own image of beauty, how they define beauty. And this, it creates problems for other women who are not so beautiful, for other women who did not find it very easy in, to come out in public, who probably have some issues. Because here, the, their society is giving us a definition of beauty. And that definition is only with 
5% or 3%, 5% of a woman in society actually fit that description. She has to be very skinny. She has to be wear this type of clothes. She has to have this and that. How many women actually fit? How many real women actually fit that description? Not many. That creates a self-esteem problem. And it creates a negative perception of what is, beauty, what is beautiful. Beauty is not just the beauty that what Hollywood makes it seem today, where you have to put a ton of makeup and go out, or you have to wear very revealing clothes. Today, many women, it's very easy for them to attract attention. If you want the negative attention, it's very easy to acquire that negative attention. You just go to Facebook, you go to Instagram, you go to these social media, and you just post a picture of yourself with revealing clothes. Isn't this what some of these actors and actresses are doing? Otherwise, what, have they, what do they have to offer? Do they have intellect? Did they do anything? Did they offer anything to society? No, she's just showing her body. And she has 15 million followers. Yes, if you want 15 million of that type of followers, the ones who just follow you for your looks and do not care about what you have to offer, then yes, you could also do that. But if you want to be accepted and cherished for who you are, then follow Fatima to Zahra as well. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The hadith says that one day during the time of Rasulullah, a blind man entered on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. This man entered on the Prophet and the hadith says, فَحَجَبَتْهُ Fatima. Fatima, she went behind the hijab. Now either she, we explained earlier, hijab could be a wall. Either she went behind the wall in a different room or she covered herself. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi asked her later on, Oh Fatima, why did you do that? He want, it's not that he's questioning her. He wants to see what does Fatima think? What does Fatima have to say? She tells him, Ya Rasulullah, in lam yarani fa'ana ara. Oh Rasulullah, if he does not see me, I see him. Wahwa yashumur reeh. And he could smell. He could smell. People, they have more than one senses. It's not just the sense of sight. Sometimes it's the scent of smell. This is why the hadith says that a female in Islamic law, a woman, her perfume, it should not be so much where it attracts attention. Because the whole purpose of hijab, the whole purpose of libas al taqwa is for the sake of modesty. You don't want to attract negative attention. Now, of course, no one is telling you to walk around smelling and not putting any deodorant or anything of that. No, go ahead and do that. But... The smell it should be not too much where it attracts attention. I remember sometimes in, in class at the university, sometimes some they walk into class, you could hear you could smell her from a mile away. As soon as she enters, the, the whole class, the, the room gets filled with the smell. And of course, there's something with men that their the memory is associated with scent as well. This is scientifically proven. Sometimes when you smell something, it brings back a, a memory. This is why even smell could be a way of breaking hijab. Hijab is all about modesty. You have to see what can you do to preserve and protect your modesty. Now, this is the taqwa portion of hijab. Now, there are some ladies and some men, they say, I find it very difficult to practice hijab. Especially right now with Donald Trump, with the Islamophobia that's going on. I am scared for my life to practice hijab. Someone might look at me in a bad way, someone might do something. And just two days ago in Chicago, it's in the news, I don't know if you all heard. A lady, she's running, to, and she's carrying a bag of food. She went shopping. She's carrying the bag of food and she's running to catch the metro, to catch the train. As she's running, suddenly four or five police officers, they tackle her down, they take off her hijab and they begin to search her in front of everyone. Why? Because they thought she was a terrorist. Just because she's wearing a hijab, just because she's a Muslim. 
However, is this enough to stop the woman from practicing hijab? Is this enough to stop a female, a modest woman, a mu'minah, a woman that takes Fatima to Zahra as a role model? Is that enough to stop her from practicing her faith? No, that's not enough. Because although it may be difficult, hijab, it's based off of principle. And this is why if you have a daughter, if you have someone in your home, you want to teach them about hijab, hijab is not a cultural thing. Hijab is a religious thing. And hijab, it should be based off of conviction. It should be based off of belief, just like all, everything in religion. If you tell your children to pray, if you tell them to fast, if you tell them anything to do, they're not doing this. They should not be doing this because of culture, because I saw my father and my grandfather and generations practicing this. Because if it's that way, easily the, the norms will change and then they will let go. But if it's based on principle, if it's based on conviction, then you will not let go of your principles. And this is why hijab, it should be based on conviction. It should be based on, um, you're convinced that this is what is right for you and this is what is right for women. Fatima Zahra, she became Sayyida to Nisa al-Alameen min al-Awwaleen wal akhirin Did she ever break the rules of hijab? She fulfilled all of her potentials. She fulfilled anything that any woman could fulfill. She went out in the masjid of Rasulullah and she spoke and she ridiculed and she spoke about the establishment that took the Khilafah of Amir al-Mu'mineen. She did that, she came out and she spoke. But she did that with hijab. She did that with practicing modesty and hijab. So if it's based on principle, it's not going to stop you, and it shouldn't stop you. And second, is a lady who decides on taking off her hijab, is that going to make her feel safer in society? What do you think? Is it going to make a lady feel safer in society? Go and look at the statistics. Go and look at the statistics. Go and see how many women in college report sexual abuse. Go and see how many women, college teenagers, report sexual abuse at the workplace, at university, and school. Why? Because she is wearing the clothes that everyone else is wearing. Maybe she took off the hijab, or she decided not to wear hijab, so that she gets a job, and she feels safer, but she will feel threatened in a different way. Now, if someone, of course, these cases of people attacking because of hijab, and attacking, they're very minimal. But the cases of attacking because of sexuality, they're very high. You come and go and compare the statistics. Then go and see which one makes you feel safer. Go and see which one makes you feel better and more okay to walk in the street. Wow. Studies show that if you wear the hijab, you will be safer. You will be respected more. And in an ideal society, people should look at you for who you are, not for your looks. If someone is looking at you for your looks and what you're wearing, then there, that, there's a problem with that person. There's a problem with that person. So, the argument that I don't feel safe because I'm practicing hijab, well, you also will not feel safe if you take off the hijab. So hijab, it is to protect the modesty. And then you also find some men, unfortunately, you find some men that say, I want to marry a woman that does not wear hijab. Or I do not want my wife, I do not want my daughter to wear hijab. This is haram. This is a haram act. And there are some narrations that speak about that type of man in a very bad way. I don't even want to say the names. I don't want to say what it says. A person who does not mind if others, they look at his wife, his daughter, and others. What kind of a person is that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we mentioned yesterday the rights, the responsibility of the man is to protect his family. The responsibility of the man is to protect his household. If you want to protect your household, you protect them through the hijab. That is one of the ways of protecting them. Now, we come and we look at the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. What did Fatima Zahra do? She preserved hijab. 
She protected the hijab. The women and the children of Imam al Hussein. It is said that one of the daughters of Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura, she lost consciousness. She fainted. And then once she woke up, she saw that Sayyidah Zainab was around her. She did not ask for water. She did not ask for anything. She says, Ya Amma, give me something to cover my water. These are the women of the Ahlul Bayt. These are the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. These are the noble women, the children of Fatima alayhi salam. Why? Because Fatima al Zahra was a lady who sacrificed her life for the sake of hijab. One of the, one of the companions of Rasulullah, Sulaim, he comes into Medina and he sees what has happened. He sees that he hears that the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen has been attacked. And he hears, there's rumors. There are people saying that the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib was attacked. So he goes to Salman, Salman al-Muhammadi. He goes to him and he asks him, قَالَ سُلَيْمٌ قُلْتُ يَا سَلْمَانُ هَلْ دَخَلُوا وَلَمْ يَكُوا اسْتِئْذَانُ Sulaim said, O oh Salman, did they enter the house of Fatima without seeking permission? قَالَ إِي وَنِعْمَةِ الْجَبَّارِ وَلَيْسَ عَلَى الزَّهْرَاءِ مِنْ خِمَارِ Yes, I swear by the name of the Jabbar, and there was no khimar on the Zahra on Fatima. فَلَاذَتْ وَرَاءَ الْبَابِ Because of hijab, for the sake of hijab, she went behind the door. She went behind the door because of her modesty. لَكِنَّهَا لَاذَتْ وَرَاءَ الْبَابِ رِعَايَةً لِلْسِتْرِ وَالْحِجَابِ He says, Fatima, she went behind the door for the sake of the hijab. Then once they felt that Fatima was behind the door, the man, he began to push on the door and she was crushed in between the wall and the door. At that moment, Fatima was pregnant. She had a miscarriage and she began to go into labor. And that was the reason Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam she lost her son Al-Muhsin. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Al-Aliyya al-Azim. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Let us raise our hands in du'a, my dear brothers and sisters. It is only a few more nights left in the month of Ramadan. Today is the last Friday of the month of Ramadan. Who knows if we're going to be around next Ramadan? Who knows if we're going to be here? We're going to have the opportunity to pray, to fast, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the coming years. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during these last nights of the month of Ramadan. نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات إنك على كل شيء قدير وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد